Um, we're now going to have a panel discussion that is going to explore some of the key challenges and opportunities that are facing the create tech sector. Um, and hopefully this will sort of lead in nicely to the breakout sessions that are going to happen afterwards. Um, and we're going to be really discussing how we can make business sense out of disruption. So join me on stage. I'd like to invite up here Jeremy Silver, who is CEO of Digital Catapult, Sarah Golding, who's IPA president and CEO of the Anne Partnership, Patrick Bradley, who's Managing Director of Station 12, and Bessie Lee, who's Founder and CEO of WithinLink. Come on up, guys. Thank you all very much for joining me. First of all, um, we have a brilliant diverse panel. So I think it would be really interesting to just sort of just go down one by one and talk a little bit about your background and how you specifically engage with the create tech industries. Okay. Okay. Um, let's start with you, Bessie, as you're sat to my left. Tell okay. me a little bit about what you do at Within Link. Okay. Um, I've been in the marketing and advertising and media space for the last 27, 28 years and still counting. I used to head up WPP China. Uh, I know WPP has been under a lot of spotlight a lot lately. Um, but I left WPP end of uh, April last year to focus on Within Link, which is a strategic investor and incubator that I started uh, and now run. Um, so we're strategic investors into marketing and advertising startup companies in China. And me and my partners, what we do is we'll, we'll try to facilitate, I guess, partnership between these young startups and marketeers and also agencies who is looking to um, uh, who's looking to marketing solutions or marketing technology solution as an enabler to find answer to marketing challenges they're facing on a daily basis. So do you sort of approach it from the challenge first? You sort of look at the challenge and then go out and see if there is a startup that could be sort of helping sort that challenge? Yeah, I guess because me and my partners, we've been in the space for so many years. Um, and then we all came from the agency background. So we're very familiar with the challenges that the overall industry in China okay. is facing. So when we go out and, and look for a uh, you know, potential prospect company, we look at their technology and when we then say to ourselves, okay, this is perfect solution to a, to a challenge that we know for years, but we yeah. haven't actually found the solution. Um, and probably if, if you are in, if you in the audience are in the agency business, you know that the agency yeah. model has been under a lot of challenges lately. It's the same, the same uh, situation in China. So I think marketeers in China are, are open to, you know, to you know, piloting new yeah. solutions. Uh, if, we, if they can use that solution to make their marketing more engaging and more compelling to the Chinese consumers. And you can probably tell from Stephen's presentation uh, before lunch, how dynamic the you know the overall market in China is, and the same with the marketing uh, you know industry in China. So uh, constantly looking for new tech, new innovation, new technology innovation to make marketing campaign even you know more engaging. It's 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 everybody's. Uh, yeah, mm. Stephen definitely touched upon um, China being that mobile first nation. Are there mm. any sort of other big tech trends that you think that China are sort of fully getting on board behind, maybe more so than the UK? I would say uh, artificial intelligence. Um, data is, is probably the first uh, fundamental uh, advantage you, in any artificial intelligence company or country uh, that you need to, to, to uh, have, I guess, or obtain. And China, 1.4 billion people, and you can tell from Stephen's presentation that we're churning up data on a daily basis. And we don't yet have a GDPR kind of regulation. Mm -hmm. um, and the Chinese government indirectly and directly have control of all the data. Um, and then the Chinese government, starting from the central government down to the local city government, um, are, are out, out there encouraging startup as well. I mean, the, the central government, uh, President Xi, started about three years ago, uh, introduced this sort of national exercise, right, or national movement, which is uh, startup by some, but innovation by all. So he wanted the entire nation to think, you know, digitally and think innovatively. And he made it almost like a mandatory um, to the local city government that st startup incubation overall scheme and, and landscape has to be part of your KPI. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, every city, whether you're a big city like Beijing and Shanghai, or you're some small city, four or fourth or fifth tier cities, you know, in a little city that you never heard of, 
they all have a startup uh, in, you know, incentive scheme. And they're all fighting for registry of all sorts of you know, startup uh, in, in China. So I would say that whole national movement um, has given the country great advantage yeah. in you know, encouraging or driving innovation. And, and what would you say are the sort of takeaway lessons that we could maybe apply to our tech startup scene here in the UK? Uh, first of all, I guess from the government side and policy side, introduce all sorts of incentive. Yeah. And make it as quick and as efficient as possible for, for young company to register. So that's the first thing. And also, uh, I guess capital market or funding doesn't necessarily have to all come from strategic VC or VC. I think government can also certainly put aside a, a, you know, a small amount of you know, funding just to get startup to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's what the government can do. And in, in, the, in the private sectors, I guess, you know, events like this to encourage a lot of collaboration and, and a lot of, uh, you know, in ideas and exchange, yep. um, that certainly helped. And we have a lot of those in, in China as well, in, in you know, all the major cities. So I think that, that overall creating that overall atmosphere, yes. that it's, it's encouraged to uh, collaborate and it's encouraged to work together to network so that we can work together to find a solution collectively uh, instead of relying just one company to become the next Google or the next yeah. Facebook, which is well, almost impossible. The correct answer, because we are at CreaTech, which is <laughs> all about collaboration and that cross fertilization exactly. of ideas. Mm. Sarah, let's move on to you. Can you tell me a little bit about your background? Because you sort of have wear two hats, don't you? I do wear two hats. Um, so the first, the, the, the paying hat, <laughs> um, is the running of a creative agency, um, which... I guess we've evolved and have had to evolve. You know, Bessie's talked about the disruption in the advertising industry, and um, industries, have, um, agencies within the industry have had to respond to that. And the way in which we've responded to it at the AND partnership is essentially to move from just a traditional advertising agency to what is, you know, we call a new model agency. And, and by that, we essentially mean we are now putting data and tech at the heart of everything we do. So we're using data and tech to cause or bring about creative and media disruption. Um, which could, you, could you give me an example of that, how it play out in a real life campaign? Um, well, whether that be, you know, for News UK, we built a creative idea around their marketing tech stack in order to um, bring to life a very different kind of campaign for the last Euros, um, where we were pushing out live headlines um, onto uh, digital sites, 100, 800 digital sites up and down the country. Um, whether that be you know, building AI into our creative process in order to generate a very different kind of idea and execution for our Lexus client um, through to actually designing and building a hoverboard. So it, it, it brings about lots of different um, creative solutions, uh, but I don't believe we would have got to these creative solutions if we hadn't started with data and tech at the very heart of the creative process. So I've seen how hard that is and how how much we've had to evolve in order to stay relevant, in order yeah. to develop marketing campaigns for our clients that are speaking to the right people in the right channels at the right time, um, and having commercial success, because ultimately, obviously, that's what it's about. Yeah. And I think, really, that was what, moving on to my second, uh, am I allowed to say this, more enjoyable hat, <laughs> um, as president of the IPA, where um, a year ago I had to come up with an agenda for the industry and that covers both creative agencies and media agencies. And I think it was because of the disruption I was feeling and also the lack of knowledge and the fear that people felt mm -hmm. in all agencies at all levels made me um, develop the magic and the machines agenda. I think that was also... Um, spurred on by the fact that my presidency comes at the start of 
the second century of the IPA's existence. So even though, unfortunately, I can only hang around for two years, or I keep asking them if they'll <laughs> change the rules, um, I wanted it to look forward to the next 100 years and yeah. wanted to think that, you know, if I could put the industry on a journey that ensured we were as fit and healthy in 100 years as we are now, i.e. still um, coming up with big ideas and innovative execution that really brings about brand and business transformation, I'd have done a good job as a president. So my agenda, The Magic and the Machines, is essentially a call to arms for the whole industry to really embrace enjoy and also trust the machines because obviously we've had a rocky road mm -hmm. uh, with the likes of um, Facebook and Google and um, ad fraud and brand safety yep. um, and and um, that that's the that's the heart of my agenda to really help the industry to see the opportunity in AI and all this emerging new technology and embrace it and start yep. to use it and yep. understand it um, because, in my view, there's nothing to be frightened of. Yep. It's, it's, they're, they're new platforms, they're new tools to get even more excited about because we can, with them, create even more relevant, even more immersive, um, even more commercially successful brand stories. But your company did still go through quite a transformation. Yeah. And, during and we're that, still on that journey, Okay, to be so fair. Is, is that uncomfortable? Like how do you create the right culture that you know, people can sort of move with the times and keep pace? Well, I think you have to hire new, different types of people from new places. I think you have to not be afraid to rip up processes and start again. But ultimately, you know, we are a creative business. And I think we haven't to be afraid of the fact that it's all about ideas at the end of the day. So yeah. you want to attract... You're in the wrong business if you're not embracing yeah, this Yeah, exactly. Kind of so it's about finding people who can um, themselves contribute to or come up with great creative ideas because it's great creative ideas that set us apart from, you know, the accentures of this world. Yeah. And, you know, that's why clients need us and want us because, you know, clients, they're generally very clever people and they can do a lot of things themselves without having to pay for the likes of us. Yeah. Um, but that's our USP. And, you know, we need to hold on to that secret sauce and that secret recipe yeah. and, and celebrate it and champion it and embrace as many of these new platforms and technologies as we can so that we're constantly adding value to those fee-paying clients. Yeah. Jeremy, can you talk to me a little bit about Digital Catapult and world work you get up to there? Absolutely, yes. So Digital Catapult is uh, one of a network of organizations um, which is designed to act as a, as a translational layer between uh, early stage innovators and, and academia and, and the commercial world. And, and is, uh, so there, there, are, there are catapults that deal with energy and transport, uh, and we deal with digital. And our focus is very much on uh, the creative industries and on manufacturing, and sometimes we uh, can learn things uh, that we've, or, or take things that we've learned in the creative industries and apply those to manufacturing, and sometimes it works the other way around. Um, and where, what we do is work with early stage companies uh, and large corporates as well. Quite often we bring them together, but what we spend time doing is really researching what those markets uh, are about, what the needs of those organizations and companies are, uh, and then creating facilities in which they can try and overcome some of the challenges that they've got, where they can come together and collaborate in, in ways that they wouldn't otherwise do uh, to find faster, better ways of overcoming some of those challenges. So a little bit uh, like some of these incubators that you've heard of, we're, we're uh, very much uh, in the sort of uh, center of things in, across the creative industries and manufacturing. We, we take a very agnostic place, so we're technology agnostic, we're commercially agnostic, and that gives us a kind of a... Uh, a privileged place, I suppose, that yeah. allows us to see what's going on uh, and also try and help things move forward very quickly. So we, we work, uh, we've got three main programs that we run, one in, in artificial intelligence, we've already heard quite a lot of people mm -hmm. reference to that, uh, but it's a long way to go, we're at the very early stages of, yeah. of AI, really. Um, we run a, a big program in future networks, which includes the Internet of Things and 5G, um, and, uh, and we also run a large uh, immersive program as well, so with uh, virtual reality, uh, AR, uh, haptics and so on. And then uh, somewhere uh, in our sort of more experimental moments, we also look at blockchain and, and 
as well wow. and that kind of thing. Amazing. Uh, so basically everything you, you're is You're taking the big ones there. Everything is tight. <laughs> We're doing it, yes. Yeah. And, and you say that you sort of try and get lessons from specifically the manufacturing um, industries and the creative industries. Um, where, where's the sort of crossover and what, is there any sort of examples of lessons that well, you've learned from, from it, that? It, it's interesting. I, you know, I mean, the, the creative industries has been through a journey probably ahead of a lot of other sectors. So, you know, when we talk amongst ourselves within the creative industry, I mean, my, my background, by the way, is in music and technology, and I've worked in music and technology for over 20 years. So, you know, I, the agenda within the creative industries is still very much about how do we embrace technology and how do we make it work. Mm -hmm. But actually, you know, when we compare uh, the way the creative industries is now to where it was 15 years ago, we've done it, we've been on a huge journey and we've learned a huge amount within this sector. Uh, and, and that is, I think, to our advantage and our benefit, and I think we see the success of the creative industries translated because of that. And other sectors have, have done so less. Okay. And, and manufacturing so has adopted less. So there's, okay. there's definitely a, a, a I'm not sure if it's a two way street. Yes, I think it's good. a tick <laughs> in the box of creative industries. <laughs> Amazing. And um, finally, Patrick, can you tell me a little bit about what you do? Um, I started life uh, in the entertainment sector, so I worked in the music sector, like Jeremy, uh, and then television and, and film, and then went into investment, so worked in a family office, and then went on to Ingenious, where I ran the ventures group there, and then at the end of 2014, uh, brought the team out and created Station 12. And we are an investor, specialist investor, in media entertainment and knowledge. And when we say knowledge, we mean education, learning, know-how, and also how those particular sectors are being enhanced by new technology. What we're not is we're not a tech investor. Um, what we are is a content investor, because what we're looking for is how does technology either enhance or enable new content opportunities to come into the market. Um, what I've known through my own career is that it's just one disruption after another. That's what creates opportunity. If you think back to Caxton and his, and his printing press, uh, that might have been the first uh, technology disruptive intervention in, in media, in, in books. But certainly the music industry was not only disrupted, but virtually destroyed by the internet. Yeah. It's really only now beginning to recover. Uh, it's certainly nothing like it was when I, um, and certainly Jeremy, were, were working in it. Um, but we know that technology <laughs> disrupts and creates new opportunities. So. We don't want to be the pioneer. We don't want to put money into technology because bags of money around the world for that. What we want to find are businesses who know how to take advantage of new technology when it's maturing in the market and showing that it's being adopted and that it can be monetized. Those are key for us. Um, and we spend a lot of time with companies right across the sector, whether it's gaming, television, live events, uh, really seeing how they are pushing forward with their business models by adopting technology. Uh, and as I say, it's very rarely at the early stage. It's usually at a stage where that technology is, is present. And certainly what we're seeing now is AI and virtual reality in particular beginning to have a broader uptake in the sector. So would you say those two are the sort of, sort of tech trends that you'd pinpoint as something that you're keenly involved in? Well, as I say, the... Our test really is to look at a business sector, see what consumers are doing, yep. what are they demanding, what's the experience they're looking for, and seeing whether they or businesses are paying, because that's key. Mm -hmm. So I think immersive entertainment is something that's really exciting. Yep. So if you take the punch drunk model, uh, which was sort of analog, that sort of experiential uh, theatre um, opportunity, then we're seeing um, VR in particular coming into that space, yep. people paying tickets, for that. Um, some of the big franchise owners are obviously going into VR, immersive entertainment, so that we do, we do like that area. So um, the VR and AR industry is predicted to grow into a 95 billion market by 2025. Um, how is that going to materialize? Because it still feels quite sort of segregated and, and insular mm -hmm. at the moment. Like you don't see that many opportunities. It's very interesting. We, we, um, I mean, our, our view of this is that, that the most of the investment that's been going on and th those numbers that you talk about, a lot of that uh, is around the investment in the hardware, in the head-mounted okay. displays, yeah. in the hand controllers and so on. Um, but, you know, whether it's the Oculus or whether it's, uh, you know, the PlayStation version or whether it's, uh, it's the uh, HTC Vive, you know, the, these platforms require content, right? The only thing that's mm -hmm. going to make them successful is if yeah. they're 
reasons why people are going to want to buy that hardware and have the experiences on them. Yeah. And, and that's where there's a real opportunity here in the UK because we, you know, we've got real strengths uh, in our film production, in games, um, in visual effects, you know, even in theatre. Uh, all of those things come together. So uh, you know, there, there is a real opportunity there. Uh, we just ran a program uh, called Creative XR, which um, we did jointly with the Arts Council, which was to, to encourage um, companies to experiment with formats that weren't just games uh, for VR and, and, and AR. And we had an incredible response. I mean, we had 1,000 expressions of interest. We had 250 companies register and, and apply, uh, from which we had to choose 20 uh, to produce prototype uh, projects. Um, but what was really important about that, and what was really interesting, was the, the willingness of, uh, of, of Google, of the BBC, of Arte, of Sony, uh, of Facebook, to come along and actually, uh, the, the commissioners in those organizations, to see the work that was being produced. Because it's about, actually, it's about creating confidence from an investment perspective. Yep. I mean, I'm personally more of a fan of AR than I am okay. currently of VR. Um, although, you know, with the arrival of 5G in 2020, that will revol revolutionize both technologies again. Yeah. So maybe things will change. But currently, I mean, I just find VR a very lonely, suffocating place. I mean, this is a big thing that I think is like bad is that it's sweaty making. It does make your face really hot. Just so, it's so a, insular. It's just a negative. Yeah, it is. And also, the, they're uncomfortable and yeah, they're very expensive, cumbersome. the yeah. actual headsets. Um, you know, in our industry, I can only reach to one good example so far. This is a personal view mm -hmm. of the use of um, VR, which was Guinness, and they work with an agency called RGA, and they used VR to bring to life some um, new Guinness variants to life. You know, the different senses, you know, your, yeah. the flavors through. Um, visual senses. I mean, it was quite it, quite interesting. It still feels quite gimmicky to me. Yeah, yeah. Whereas AR, much more interesting. Um, you know, you can already reach to really great creative examples, whether that be uh, Lego um, and their build studio, whether it be I'm not going to be able to think of anything now. <laughs> Ikea, yeah. uh, Airbnb. You know, there's some really great campaigns where I think it's easier to use as well for creative people. And it's definitely less insular because of totally. the very nature of it. Yeah. That you're still interacting. Is that something? Yeah, one of, one of our portfolio company has found an interesting commercial application of AR, which is e-commerce. <laughs> Yeah. Mm. Uh, this company called Touch Virtual, um, what they've done is they found a way to introduce standardized AR solution and, and marry that with e-commerce uh, in China. So any brands, well, the e-commerce uh, environment in China is slightly different to the Amazon environment. So it's like Alibaba's e-commerce platform, it's an open platform. So you as a brand, you, you can come up to Alibaba and, and open up your own shop, mm -hmm. but you have to manage it yourself and you have to manage all the back end. So Alibaba only provide you with the platform, the traffic, and also the payment gateway. So their competition is called JD.com. So what Touch Virtual has done is they've created this uh, AR showroom solution. So the, the, the brand store um, management team can just sign up and then use their solution and create an a, a AR, AR you know, product showroom wow. and put it onto the e-commerce storefront. So if I want to buy home appliances, I, you know, I search for this product and there is an AR showroom button and I touch and on my little you know, mobile screen, I get into a, an AR uh, virtual showroom where I can just go around to 3D, 360 mm -hmm. uh, filming. And for product itself, they can uh, show you uh, how, it actually is, is, how it actually works in this AR showroom. So because it's a standardized product, and it's, it's very easy to, to, for, for any brands to self-administer, I guess. So agency and brands can just administer yourself. And it can be very easy uh, to just upload to the e-commerce platform. So in China, because the e-commerce is so mature, it, it, everybody's buying on e-commerce. So whether a platform or brand stores, they're constantly looking for a new ways to make that shopping experience um, you know, even more engaging or, or more interesting for shoppers to share. Mm -hmm. So, so that, that's why uh, this company, Touch Virtual, found a gap and then found a new interest, I guess. Yeah. 
and I say, okay, AR definitely, like Sarah said, is a lot quicker to adopt. Mm. But if we're ex expecting brands and agency to create that AR product, it, the, the, the timing is very long. The lead time is too long. It's too 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 much, too costly of an exercise. Yeah. So what they've done is introduce a standardized product that everybody yeah. can use and very easy to use. Brilliant, mm. brilliant. Well, it's like Snapchat and their open platform. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Can we move on to AI as a sort of topic of discussion? Yes. Um, sort of a big one. But I sort of want to know, firstly, how is it going to impact the creative industries? I know, Sarah, you said that you're sort yeah. of embracing it and you shouldn't be scared of it. Obviously, there are some negative repercussions of AI. Um, sort of as a broad overview, like, what are you most excited about? Well, I, I don't see AI as displacing humans, you know. So that's why my agenda is the magic and the machines. It's not... The magic yeah. or the machine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I think together, the future feels very exciting. Unfortunately, I think the best cases of AI in our industry right now are pretty well hidden because um, it's used to mine customer data. Yeah. But there are some examples. Um, I mean, Netflix as a business is brilliant at using AI within its creative process mm -hmm. to chop up all those thousands of hours of amazing content to serve you seemingly personal messages and content recommendations. Mm -hmm. um, you have Cosa Bella, the lingerie retailer, working with um, Albert AI, and they have essentially revolutionized that brand's social marketing activity. Um, to you know, huge success. I think it's you know three times, well helped create three times return on investment. Are the last figures I looked at. Yep. Um, you've got you know I've talked about Lego with the you know they're using um, AI now, mostly to uh, reach new audiences. I mean it's still in its infancy, yep. but beyond our industry, you are seeing um, you know in fashion in Australia. You've, there are fashion designers working with AI platforms to create their next, you know, spring summer collection. You've got music. You know, you'll know about this more than I do. You know, is it jukebox that yes. you know? Jukebox so creates songs. Yeah, yeah, music yeah, collaborators work music. exactly. Yeah. Um, I mean, Accenture. They they published that report, didn't they, last week? And they've predicted that in twenty between twenty twenty five and twenty twenty eight. AI alone will produce a blockbuster movie. Now, I don't believe that. I think AI will produce its own movie in 2025, but it'll be shit. So it won't be a blockbuster. <laughs> yeah. Because I think the beauty is the two things coming together. You know, the, 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 the trite example is um, the piece of music that was composed using yeah. purely AI, and yes, the lyrics the are diabolical. Yes, yeah. it's a Beatles sound alike. Oh, well, actually, the thing that, the point, don't you well, think? the thing that's interesting, uh, the, the guys at, at Duke Deck, um, you know, th this is a, uh, such a, a very bright people with a music background from Cambridge who decided that they would try and get a computer to make music. The, the interesting thing is, of course, that the, the, the more successful they are, the more kind of appalled they are by what, what the implications <laughs> of what they're doing are. But, but in, in talking to them, one of the things that, was, that I thought was really intriguing was they said, actually, the thing that was most difficult, but potentially had the most potential, was to discover the glitches in their algorithms that created sort of imperfections in the music, mm. and that that actually made the music more interesting, yeah. and that that's what they were trying to sort of pursue. But I'm, I'm not I'm not sure that you know I think we could all get incredibly paranoid if we you know with this idea that suddenly that you know all these uh, AI systems were going to start creating tons of content and you know creative people would have nothing yet left to do. Yeah. That seems to me to be so very, very far away yeah. yes. um, and so really very uninteresting as well in what it's like to produce. That's not to be the thing we should worry about. But I, but I do think that the, uh, you know, the, 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 the place where we're seeing it most at the moment uh, is in recommendation and discovery yeah. of individual tastes. So Spotify does this incredible thing at the moment, right, where they, where, where on a weekly basis, produce over a billion playlists, each of which is individualized and personalized yeah. for the particular subscriber. That's an, I mean, that is an incredible mm. technical achievement. And as an end user of that, it's not bad. Yeah. It's not brilliant, but it's, it's, it's good yeah. enough. So, you know, we're, that, that, there, there's some way to go. The places where it becomes difficult is where personal information starts to be used mm -hmm. and where the, where the ethics of those choices um, you know, need to be scrutinized and need to be made more visible. And, and there's a, there are a lot of challenges 
in how to make algorithms uh, visible in that way. Uh, and you know, when you talk to Google about their adventures in this space, you know, the thing that the engineers get excited about is the fact that the AI system did something and came up with a result, and they don't know how they did it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's scary. Yeah. Right? When, they, when the engineers themselves don't understand how it was they got the answer they got, <laughs> that's, that's when you start, have, that's the sort of the, you know, the, the beginning of the slippery slope, perhaps. Now, you also touched upon blockchain as something that you find interesting, an area. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Are you sort of investing in that in particular at the moment? Um, we've, uh, blockchain is probably, of all the hyped areas, that's the most hyped one. Um, <laughs> so we've been very, very focused in, in, I mean, part of what we try and do is actually, you know, get rid of the hype and figure out what can you actually do with this stuff. Um, <laughs> and that's what we have technical people doing. Yeah. Um, we've, put, we've put a focus on one area, actually, of, of, of um, blockchain, which was to try and think about whether we could use it uh, to help overcome challenges when um, people create, do run creative projects casually. So where a group of people might, without having formed a company or without having any contractual agreements, started to put a project together, maybe to make a game, for example. And someone came in and did one thing, did the lighting, somebody else wrote the script, somebody else created some characters. Uh, and then they all drift off and do other things, and suddenly someone wants to commission it, and who gets the credit, and where does the money go? Uh, and we've created a little prototype that allows that to, to happen, and, and uh, is quite a lightweight way of, of getting people to be able to register their contributions. So uh, I do think there are some practical applications in, in being able to, to you know, memorialize forever yeah. a particular piece of information, but um, there's also vast amounts of hype. Yes. And, and, Patrick, uh, do you think it's overhyped or do you think it's something we should be excited about? I think um, we have a way to go. I mean, we certainly keep blockchain under review. We see where the developments are. We've had lots of conversations with the music industry in particular. Yep. So the music majors are obviously studying blockchain because they have a paranoia about any new technology that yeah. is likely to disrupt them. Yeah. Um, in their case, the people most likely to be disrupted by blockchain are the people in the royalties department, finance, accounting. So I think to a certain extent, there is a sort of embedded block, if you'll excuse the yeah. pun, to adopting blockchain. <laughs> but also, I think it's the use case. They have to understand what is it actually going to do for them? How is it either going to create a solution or generate new revenue for them? Yeah. Uh, and I think when you're looking at either the film studios or the, or the, the music majors, it is an, uh, an, uh, an enormous undertaking t for them to understand how blockchain could be integrated in a way that's going to be adopted across the, uh, in the industry in a meaningful way. Yeah. Um, I think it probably will start at the independent, independent music label level, okay. where I think, well, we're certainly we've seen a number of businesses who are beginning to sign new rights to blockchain and building that up, and some of the music publishing businesses that are going into signing their own rights. But I think that, you know, there's a way to go before we see that really break through. It's hard to work out, though, isn't it? You know, if, if this is about making business sense out of disruption, you sort of, you know blockchain is on the horizon and that it could, uh, you know, completely disrupt your industry. Well, how do you know when to make the decision to invest into something like that? You know, is it ever clear cut or well, I think I think, the, you know, it's interesting. It, it, you go back to the days when, when the web was disrupting the music industry and, and uh, you know, a few of us, and I was amongst them, were sort of trying to be pioneers and yeah. knocking on the door saying, hey, this might just change your business. Um, and, and there was always this feeling, well, how much pain does there have to be before yeah. you're going to make the change? Um, and so some of it is about a return on investment. And, and you know, if the, the return is too far out, it's very hard for people who are driven by a quarterly number yep. or a quarterly target to be able to see what that longer term benefit is. So there's a, there's a challenge in that. I think with blockchain, there's an even greater challenge, which is that it requires a kind of a broader adoption. So it's not something that if you adopt it as a single company, there's an awful lot of benefit to you for doing. It's only if a, a, you know, a large sector of your community or yeah. you know, fellow rights owners, if you're a rights owner, were to adopt it, that, that it could start to have some meaning. So that will slow the adoption of blockchain in that, in that context. Yeah, I think you're al always looking at the, the sort of tipping point mm -hmm. for technology yeah. in the sense that that's also connected with the consumer. What's, what is the consumer doing? Yeah. Because if you look at streaming and you look at what's happening now generally within the market, there is a, there is a willingness to subscribe and a willingness to pay. Yeah. Whereas you take that back 10 years ago, mm -hmm. there was mass piracy. No one wanted to pay yeah. for anything. Technology was disrupting. But would you invest in those, in those platforms? No, you wouldn't because... Mm -hmm. 
there was no economic relevance at that point in time. So I think what we're seeing now is because the consumer has changed their behavior in mm -hmm. relation to certain technologies, there is a willingness to pay, and that makes it relevant, and that will attract investment. Brilliant. Um, finally, let's just move on to the Internet of Things and the connected home. I would put it open to everybody. Like um, Having the connected home and having different technologies inside the house, how do you think that would lead to different opportunities for brands to advertise and engage with their customers? I think, I think home will, might become the new uh, marketing battleground. Do you think? That in the past, uh, marketeers and agency are having a hard time to really penetrate. Yeah. But I think with Internet of of things uh, that create a new opportunity. So a company in China called Xiaomi, um, they, they, they manufacture a headset for a star. But very quickly, uh, the founder decided to, to move into smart home as well. So Xiaomi, other than the mobile handsets they manufacture, they also manufacture rice cookers, air purifier, air conditioner, mm -hmm. uh, uh, many things I can't even, yep. there's so many of them. Um, but you control all of that using the Xiaomi mobile handsets. So because, you know, it's, a, it's very common uh, for, let's say, a, a, an engineer in China who's a loyal to the Xiaomi brand, have so many Xiaomi branded uh, home yeah. appliances ho at home. And because it's all connected with his mobile yeah. handsets. So first of all, that behavior and that usage data that that particular user generated is, is very interesting yeah. to home appliance brands. Yeah. But also, you now have so many different marketing opportunities to engage with that consumer, mm -hmm. more than just um, the mobile handsets. So, so that, that's what Xiaomi has been doing in China. And if you go back to Mary Meeker's uh, annual report, la I think it was last year or the year before, I can't remember, but she dedicated that two pages of her 300-page report just to talk about this whole smartphone ecosystem that Xiaomi is, yep. is building. So I think from, from what Xiaomi is, 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 is doing in China, I think that created an interesting a new uh, marketing battle. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Anything else? I think, I think the voice, voice technology is um, a challenge because, you know, you see it yourself in the home. There is every possibility now that you can sidestep brand and retail channels to market through your um, you know your Alexa, Alexa or your yeah. Google Home. You know, you can sidestep <coughs> waitrose, you can you can you know just ask for detergent as, yeah. to, as opposed to a particular brand. And I think that is terrifying for marketeers. But I guess <coughs> it's pushing us as their uh, marketing partners to think about a different type of brand dynamic. You know mm -hmm. we We've never had conversations before about, um, okay, what are the voice properties of this brand? Yeah. Who is the, mm -hmm. you know, owl ambassador of Weetabix mm -hmm. or uh, British Gas or whoever? Yeah. You know, so I do think, you know, again, it's a threat and an opportunity. Mm. Personally, it's a bit disconcerting at the moment because I think that the technology is still, I mean, it's not in beta, but sometimes it feels like it is when you're watching television and Alexa Oh yeah, Alexa always does that to, to me. I mean, it's yeah. really quite Or from spooky. a, yeah, perhaps from a line, so she always talks back to my yeah. mm -hmm. well, I mean, I, I, I suppose, yeah, I, I, no, I agree. I, I mean, I have to confess, I have a very intimate relationship with Alexa. <laughs> me too, um, <laughs> I do love but, Alexa. But um, uh, the, the problem I find is that, you know, it's the most interesting thing she has to say she usually says unprompted or an inappropriate moments. <laughs> uh, I mean, I've got a lot of friends like that too, actually. Yeah. Uh, but you, you know, won't, you won't I, I mean, we've, got, <laughs> we've got a long way to go. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, I, I think it will uh, create lots of uh, opportunities in, in, in different areas, particularly in art. We saw quite an interesting proposition last week where um, the idea about sharing art in offices and houses through a screen. So yeah. every now and again, it would it would reprogram the art that was in your office, uh, which I don't I don't know if that's going to be taken up. But actually, for emerging artists, it's great to get yeah. a much wider distribution. Mm -hmm. And in terms of sharing, um, you know, more well-known art, particularly through museums and cultural organisations, I thought that was that was quite interesting. Yeah. We'll, we'll see. Okay. Um, so finally, uh, so a question to just go down each of the panellists. Um, how will the coming together of creativity and technology catalyse new opportunities in the wider economy? Is there sort of one thing that you'd say 
that, that the two coming together will create. I think, I think to take certainly what I see in China is technology is really the, the enabler to empower marketers and agency to do things that you, in the past you probably didn't have the opportunity, didn't have technology to do. Yeah. Um, and also, if you use it rightly and appropriately, it will free up a lot of your time in the past where you just do repetitive work. Yeah. Free that up for you to do, you know, the human bit. The human bit. Yeah. The human intelligence that yeah. artificial intelligence can never take yeah. over. Yeah. Yeah. So that's my view. Lovely. I think, you know, in the advertising industry, I think creativity and tech have always come together. Yeah. You only call it tech when you don't really understand it, when it's yeah, shiny and it seems new. It turns into and you're not sure stuff. how it works, yeah. well, that's tech. Yeah. Whereas, you know, television and radio are tech. Yeah. And, you know, if we use tech in the same way, the new tech in the yeah. same way, then it will be incredibly commercially successful because, you know, as I've said before, you use television and radio to tell really engaging brand stories. You'll use VR, AR and AI to tell even more relevant, even more immersive yeah. brand stories. And the IPA has years and years of evidence to prove that you know, the perfect combination of rational and emotional connection drives commercial success yeah. for brands. So you know, from my perspective and the advertising industry, I think it will just bring about more and more commercial success. Yeah, and different platforms, yeah. lovely. Jeremy. I think I think we're going to see a you know an increasingly uh, personalised, increasingly customised world. We're going to be receive be on the receiving end of, of more and more of things which are more curated and selected, especially for us. And I think that will be both exciting at times and suffocating at other times. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there's there's also you know I mean much of what we've talked about today in relation to what we're seeing within creative industries is is also emerging in other sectors. Um, and the sort of cross-fertilization, I think, is, is really powerful. I, you know, I was talking about the Spotify playlists. Uh, I came across a, a company recently who are in the manufacturing sector who are running a, creating a platform um, that is supplying components to, to big machine makers um, who had taken a piece of the code from Spotify that's because it was open source and had adapted it so that they could actually use that to recommend the right component wow. uh, to end users. That, that's that was really interesting. Yeah. I mean, th they were very proud of the fact that they were <laughs> powered by Spotify. But I, you know, I think that sort of cross-fertilization could be really interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Patrick. Um, in, ter in terms of the wider economy, obviously it's, it's great news for the UK, which is geographically a small market, but allows us to really um, communicate what we can do on a, on a much wider broad uh, basis, but I think the really interesting space is education and knowledge. There's obviously that intersection between entertainment and, and knowledge and education, particularly through gaming, but I think for developing countries, I think that access to education and knowledge can be more easily delivered by some of these new te technological uh, disruptions. I think that's really exciting how that can enhance the flow of knowledge and, and learning across the globe. Thank you. Well, Patrick, Jeremy, Sarah and Bessie, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.